At a government-sponsored peace conference in Baghdad, I found the only woman in Saddam Hussein's cabinet. Dr. Huda is the Minister for Sport and Youth. Dr. Huda, we have seen firsthand the suffering that economic sanctions have caused many Iraqi people. Um, do, you, do you believe that economic sanctions ever have a place as a legitimate policy to create change? Uh, they never have been, uh, especially this type of comprehensive uh, embargo that was imposed upon Iraqi people and Iraq as a country. Uh, the nation suffered from economical embargo, technological and scientific ones. So it's type of uh, unprecedented sanctions that uh, were not imposed on any other country or nation in the history of humanity, which uh, made it uh, something uh, more like a genocide, actually. More than half a million Iraqi child uh, has died, and more than one million and a half adults died because of direct or indirect reasons, all of them related to the continuation of the sanction. So uh, I don't think, not for Iraq, not for any other nation, uh, such embargo or actually such reason or reasons uh, would make any such thing legitimate. Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking of a Many people perceive the sanctions that were imposed on South Africa, which ended apartheid, um, or one of the reasons for ending apartheid, as being a success. Um, do, you, do you think that, that you could call them a success? Uh, no, I don't, especially uh, the reasons that those sanctions were uh, imposed are not valid anymore. There were uh, UN resolution uh, resolutions uh, were declared uh, in 1991. They are mainly five resolutions. All of them, Iraq fulfilled its duties toward them since the, the beginning of uh, 1993. So actually, even if we consider the motives and the reasons behind those resolutions, are justified. Iraq fulfilled its uh, duties and applied all of them uh, and therefore there is no reason to continue this embargo. Uh, uh, no matter how the standards uh, are looked for as a success for this embargo, uh, we think that the human cost that resulted uh, would not consider anything as a success. The huge sacrifices, especially among the uh, civilians, and of course all of them are innocent people. They have nothing to do with uh, any uh, political conflict that uh, the country went through. When um, sanctions are lifted, um, what what are some of the first things you would like to see changed in Iraq? Of course, first of all, we would like to see the Iraqi people have returned once again to their uh, status that they were uh, occupying before the uh, uh, beginning of the sanctions uh, in 1991. Iraq, you see, was not considered a third world country, a third world society anymore before the 1990, as far as uh, educational services uh, are concerned, as far as health care uh, is concerned, etc. So we would like to see that uh, uh, all those standards and services return back, so Iraq would resume once again its uh, humanitarian rule as a civilized nation who contributed to humanity for more than 6,000 years now, and we would like to continue our mission. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, important to look forward to. But then again, uh, uh, although we hope 
uh, in this matter, but how can you uh, compensate for the wife who lost her husband, uh, for the uh, uh, mother who lost her child because of lack of uh, health care and medicine? I don't think any development will make up for that. Um, the next few weeks are particularly critical for Iraq. Do you um, feel personally prepared for what may happen? Yes, of course, definitely. As every Iraqi uh, man and woman are, uh, we seek peaceful solution for the uh, suspended problems, but we are fully prepared to face whatever will come, and we are fully prepared to defend our country, our territory, against any aggression. Do you feel um, more prepared now than during the Gulf War? I mean, I've spoken to quite a few Iraqi people who just didn't think anything in was going to happen, so they, they weren't fully prepared, whereas now they feel well, that if America says they are going to attack, they probably will. Um, yes, that is definitely correct. People now, they know what uh, uh, will happen because they faced uh, something uh, similar uh, during the aggression in 1991. Uh, you see, uh, during that war, a uh, huge number of uh, our civilian uh, sites were attacked. Almost all the infrastructure was destroyed and rebuilt again by Iraqis. So people now know how to deal with lack of electricity or water. Or, But again, no matter how you prepared, uh, you cannot stop a massive crisis from occurring, for example, of the water supply and cleaning and sterilizing water uh, instruments were destroyed. That will make uh, a huge opportunity for the spread of infectious diseases, etc. So uh, yes, emotionally people are much, much more prepared, but there is a fundamental difference. In 1991, when the aggression occurred on Iraq, uh, the country was not under embargo before. So there were a lot of equipments existing and storage materials and stuff. Uh, now the nation will be facing aggression. And before that aggression, the nation suffered from almost 12 years of comprehensive embargo. So that makes they will defend themselves, lacking uh, uh, a lot of essential materials. They need to defend themselves. They need to protect themselves from uh, spread of disease or from shortage of uh, food and supplies, etc. So that will make their duties even harder. But emotionally, uh, spiritually, they think they uh, uh, are people Will, who fulfilled their duties toward the international community. They are people sitting inside their country, defending their own territory. They, they have the right on their side, so that gives them tremendous uh, uh, emotional and uh, uh, spiritual strength and uh, a strong feeling that we are defending uh, a very basic principle that any man or woman should be protecting its homeland. And that is a huge power. That's why they are ready to defend Iraq. Um, if, if Iraq is attacked, etc., and you know, the, the government um, you know, falls down, there's, you know, uh, do you think the Iraqi people will accept an, an American choice of, of, um, of leader. Are, are they, will, will they, I know what they're saying the American media is what they'd like to do is just weaken the Iraqi spirit so much that they will just go, okay, whatever, we've had enough, we've had enough trouble, we're, we're tired now. Do you think 
do you think that um, the Iraqi spirit will be broken by, by the Americans, as they're hoping? Uh, let me ask you uh, the question, would the Australian accept American government? Would the Canadian or the British or the Italian accept the American government? Would the Indian accept the American government? So the peace, um, I mean, you must have seen all the peace marches around the world um, in support of um, no aggression on Iraq, no war. Um, it, seems, it seems perhaps that the people in countries like Australia, America, Canada, don't want this to happen, but the governments do. How how do you think? I mean, how do you think it's possible maybe to change opinion, public opinion around enough to change government the government opinion in the West? Uh, the West claims that uh, it has the perfect democracy. Now, I think this is the perfect time to prove whether there is democracy in the West or not. If such democracy exists, then the voice of those tens of millions of people who are rejecting the war and calling upon peaceful solution uh, should take its place. Uh, this is one thing. The other thing is that uh, Iraq has always seeked peaceful solution for the problem and uh, all what Iraq is uh, asking is to give peace a chance. Uh, that's not too much to ask. That should be given the proper time to deal with and resolve all the suspended problems as I mentioned. And the third thing is I hope we can convince uh, the leaders and the people that the long-term benefit of Australian people or even American people in that matter relies in the mutual cooperation between Iraq and uh, Australia or Iraq and the US uh, such cooperation based on respect and uh, for each other and uh, cooperation that takes care of long-term benefit for both people on the two sides not by invasion even if the uh, huge amount of forces even if they can achieve some success but even that is doubtful. But let's assume that they achieve some limited success on, on the ground or they occupy oil or what have you. That will only uh, achieve limited short-term benefit. It will not at all gain long-term benefit for the Australian or the American uh, public uh, because it will, on one, first of all, I mean, the top priority that uh, uh, what will happen, it will accumulate mountains and mountains of hatred uh, toward the West uh, that uh, I feel that Australian people do not deserve to be hated that much because their government or their country supported such invasion uh, and, uh, and certainly Australian people uh, do not deserve it and they don't need it, okay? But uh, such hatred around the world will be accumulated, you cannot avoid it. So uh, that's why I say that such hatred might bring a lot of unnecessary things that can be avoided by peaceful uh, solution to the problem. You suggested before maybe a, a practical way um, for people's misunderstandings um, to, to change is for more Australians to perhaps visit 
Iraq yes. um, to come here as guests. Um, how, how do you think that we can maybe achieve this? Oh, Iraq has opened its arms uh, for any visitors and uh, we are willing to welcome any delegations. Uh, uh, the top number is not limited uh, from any sector. We can speak of students and youth because these are the programs that we deal with uh, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, we will welcome any delegations, any uh, number, any programs, any uh, exchange of, uh, uh, you know, ideas for activities to be done here in Iraq. Uh, any initiative, I mean, will be welcomed uh, to be performed here in Iraq. So. Uh, Hi, everybody. You are welcome to be here and visit our lovely city, Baghdad, and Iraq, which is Mesopotamia, that you have, uh, uh, I'm sure you have studied a lot about it in your uh, school days. This is Mesopotamia, and Mesopotamia welcomes you uh, to come and visit for a few days. Uh, this is one thing. On the other hand, uh, uh, we will uh, try to keep in mind to invite uh, Australians uh, to attend our activities like student conferences uh, and uh, youth camps, uh, uh, athletic camps, athletic uh, uh, activities, uh, innovation activities, art, culture, etc. We will do that, and it's up to you how you can uh, uh, deal with it. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. Very You're very welcome. welcome.